Hallo. It's time to start. Good evening and welcome to the School of Economics and Management. I am Christine Enroth and I'm the Vice Dean of the School. And it's a real pleasure to be here tonight to wish you all welcome. Those of you who have come to, to the hall to take part of this presentation. And of course, those of you who follow this online since we are streamed. We are, we are filmed and we are streamed live. Hi, Could Mom. Be good. <laughs> I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> and it's, of course, a pleasure for me to be here to, to present tonight's speaker, Dr. Stein Klepester. And among the very many things one can say about uh, Stein, I would like to stress a few things. I would like to stress the fact that he is the program director for one of our flagship programs, the master program in management. And master programs in management, with the acronym MIM, Masters in Management, started to flourish uh, at the major European business school six or seven years ago. Uh, it was London Business School who was the first, uh, quickly followed by London School of Economics and Imperial College. And what is a MIM program then? Well, that is a very special kind of program because it's aimed at students who have a background in something else than in business. So incoming students have a background in, for example, engineering, law, social science, and an interest to, to pursue a career in management. And what we do then is to, to pr try to provide a in-depth, high-speed, very intensive year of training in management. And this is the guy responsible for that. And that takes some skills, people. Yep. It takes skills in knowing how to handle teaching and learning, being astute when it comes to, to pedagogics in a, in a general sense. And it also requires that, that you are very well connected to the corporate world. Because you have to understand what corporations are looking for in new managers. And all of that describes Stain. Thank you. Um, and it's also a very good background if you're interested in, in strategic thinking. Because how can we understand strategic thinking? Well, we can understand that in today's world, it seems to be more important than ever. We can go from the political arena to, to major corporations and come up with the conclusions that we need more of good strategic thinking. And the question is then, how do we get this and what is it? Is strategic thinking the same as strategic management? Well, no, as Dane is going to explain, that is not the same. Um, can it be measured? How can we understand it? And we are going to, to take part in some interesting new research on, on this. And there are some really fascinating experiments going on in how we can understand strategic thinking. Um, and I've noticed that this um, presentation comes with a promise. 
And it comes with a promise that we can all learn how to think strategically. And that's a good promise. For a small fee, that is. For a small, oh, now, now he's talking. Now he's talking. Uh, so that means that whomever you enter into this hall or whomever you are online watching this, you enter it as whomever you are, but you're going to leave as a strategic thinker. And that is what I would call a promise of deliverance. So without much further ado, I'm going to give the uh, floor to Stein. And please, folks, join me in a welcoming hand. Thank you, Christina, um, for those kind words. Um, 45 minutes is very short for the magic that I'm going to do now, so pay attention. Um, I'm here to talk about um, some ideas that I have been uh, messing around with for quite some uh, time, many, many years, but didn't know what to do uh, uh, with until um, I discovered uh, some um, uh, people around the world thinking roughly about the same things. And, and in the process of that, I, I came across um, the, 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 the one uh, missing link uh, that, that I needed, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, many years ago, a, a, a Canadian researcher, Elliot Jack, developed a theory. I knew about this theory, but couldn't do anything with it until I met Marita Prenslow, a South African psychologist who developed a, a tool, um, a, a test, you might say, uh, indicating um, uh, or measuring, uh, we think at least, uh, some fundamental uh, cognitive processes. And together with uh, some colleagues, among other things, uh, Carl Henrik Nilsson that I can see in the back there taking notes, um, uh, we are uh, beginning, very much in the beginning, of testing this tool on all sorts of people. I also see some of my students here, uh, and together with two of them, uh, we are uh, in the process of conducting the first part, testing some 50 uh, individuals, 25 master students and 25 executives. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. The, the project uh, is basically saying that uh, um, maybe, maybe uh, we are living in a time where the ability to think strategically is more important than it has been for many, many years. Um, I'm not sure that's the fact, but I'll argue for it in a, in, in, in a few minutes. Um, but no matter what, uh, we're asking, okay, so what is strategic thinking? Um, can it be measured in any meaningful way, and can it be developed in human beings as well as in, in organizations. Uh, I've been working, uh, apart from at the school, also as a consultant for many, many years, and I've been in, I don't know how many management teams where they said stuff like, we need to spend more time thinking strategically, we need a strategy, but they never or very seldom actually get there, and I'm beginning to suspect that the reason is that they're not able to. Uh, so it's a wish without capacity, and uh, this is one of the things that we are going to look into. As I said, it's built on, on some theories of, uh, of Elliot Jack, and uh, it's brought uh, forward uh, in, in a more contemporary form uh, through uh, uh, Maretta Prenslow and her company Cognadev. You'll see that name here and there in this presentation. Uh, it's, a, it's a consulting firm that uh, provides uh, a test that we're going to talk about, called CPP, a Cognitive Process Profiling. Um, it is uh, um, coming at a time when we are more and more interested in cognitive uh, theory. Uh, almost any person I meet nowadays are talking about, uh, uh, oh, did you read the book Thinking Fast and Slow? So fascinating. Maybe one of the few times ever that uh, people are actually reading a Nobel laureate. Um, but he is pointing to something, and he is not alone, that maybe we need to understand more fundamentally uh, how human beings are behaving cognitively-wise, what is shaping the way we think and therefore the way we act. And I think maybe that uh, the experience of, uh, 
of our newly elected uh, uh, President uh, uh, Trump is also providing us some insight on, on how completely wrong things can go when some things. And, and maybe uh, we can shed some light on that. But it is early days, so what I'm going to do is to show you some snapshots of some of the blackboard drawings that we are in the process of, of creating right now. But before I do that, uh, uh, a short introduction. Um, what is strategy and why do we need strategy? Um, I came across this uh, 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 picture, um, uh, Dead End, and it sort of uh, illustrates uh, the way I'm thinking. Um, maybe we have been living through a period of, of relative stability and, 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 and therefore an increased ability for us to see uh, the terrain in front of us. Maybe because uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the development of business, the development of technology, uh, the development of uh, social interaction, culture, politics, ideology uh, has been relatively stable. But we are now maybe in a, in a, in a period that that is no longer the case. Um, I mean, the, 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 the typical uh, representatives of, of technology, globalization, um, are often used to, to illustrate the fact that maybe we are living more in, in turbulent times than, than, than before. And one possible consequence of that is that we can no longer, to the same extent, rely on the uh, already existing solutions because the problems are fundamentally new. Um, so, as it says, this is the dead end of a normal avenue. We need to find a new normal, and that is going to happen over, I think, uh, uh, the, the next uh, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, um, uh, and maybe uh, not even inside that. And that might mean that we, we do need now, more than ever, an understanding of what it takes to think strategically. Now, I see uh, two schools, old school, new school. The old school, to me, seems like thinking that strategy is a model or models or a logic that we have developed based on past experience. Um, and that's okay as long as the road ahead simu simulates the road we have passed. But we also do know that uh, most of these models that, at least those of you who have uh, read some uh, uh, business like Porter's Five Forces, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are not necessarily seen as equally valuable and viable today as they were when they were invented. Not even Michael Porter believes in his own theories anymore. They are basically obsolete. But that seems to me to be the old school. Let's look back, let's see a pattern, let's build some theories and then use these theories to make decisions about the future. Now, new school is, uh, sounds something like this. Uh, in a true strategic situation, the value of looking backwards should be lower. Uh, therefore, we need another way of increasing the ability to think strategically. Uh, and one way to go might be to look into the fundamental cognitive processes going on in our brain when we think strategically. I'm going to look into what I, what I mean with that later on, but that is the starting point of this, this, this project. It's a little bit slow, huh? So, uh, what is strategic thinking? Uh, well, uh, the way we define this is to say strategic thinking is the thinking that comes before, hopefully, uh, a strategic decision making. And strategic decision making, as I say here, is making decisions in which we commit a substantial amount of resources uh, for a, and that are limited and for a long time. Uh, which means that um, it is important because it's a substantial. 
uh, and because it's limited, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, uncertain because it is over time. And uh, the, the, the further into the future the consequences of this decision is going to be pan out, the more uncertainty we will have simply because uh, of all sorts of uh, ripple effects that can uh, occur when um, small initial changes get the time to spin off and create all sorts of snowball effects. Uh, it is basically a situation where we are making decisions into the unknown. Uh, there is no way we can know all the things that we would have liked to know in order to make these decisions. So we have to deal with the fact that it is basically unknown. And the question then is, what happens to the way we think once we realize that we are heading for uh, the unknown? Now, I hear from time to time the argument that, well, if it is unknown, we shouldn't make any decisions. Uh, and uh, that is, of course, uh, um, impossible, because not making a decision is also a decision. Now, that's the easy answer. The more complicated answer is to say, even if we decide not to make a decision, we do make decisions. But if we are not aware of the strategy that is behind, or the, the thinking going behind the, the decisions we make, and therefore the, the behavior we show, uh, we are m possibly behaving unconscious. It is better to be aware of the logic that shapes the behavior than be unaware. And possibly, this is one of the ideas that we are going to look into, possibly uh, uh, at times, we avoid seeing the strategic nature of the decisions we are about to make and therefore make wrong decisions. Now, a part of this has to do with the, the, the fundamental difference between bad and wrong decisions. Uh, this is another thing I've, uh, uh, I often hear, hear that, uh, well, you can't be sure that the decision is right. No, you can't. Uh, any decision might be wrong, and the further into the future the effects of this decision will come, the, the, the larger the, uh, the possibility of being wrong. But it can be a good decision. A good decision defined as, at the point in time when we make decision, we utilize the best available information and the best available process of thinking. And by improving the quality of the thinking, we also improve the quality of the decision. That doesn't guarantee that it's never going to be wrong, but we can at least say we did the best possible effort at that point in time. Okay. Battery problem? No. Distance. It was far too in, into the future. Now, one way of describing this is to say something like this. Um, uh, and uh, this is a gross uh, simplification, but for the purpose of uh, a blackboard drawing, it, it might do. Um, we can think uh, in terms of two types of extreme domains, the operational domain and the strategic domain. The operational domain is characterized by a relatively low or an extremely low level of complexity. Uh, at least uh, uh, the complexity that you might see there is what we call detail complexity. It might be mo many details and they might be connected in many different ways, but uh, it's, the, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a complexity we can deal with because it's not dynamic. Now, when we talk about dynamic complexities, we're talking about um, the type of uh, issues that arises when, when uh, the, uh, the components in the thinking will change shape and form uh, when you try different combinations. It's basically like putting together a jigsaw puzzle where the pieces actually change shape and form when you touch them or when you try to put them together. And you need to figure out what is the logic behind that change. And that is very soon going to be so complex that it's very, very difficult to deal with. So as complexity goes from detailed complexity to dynamic complexity, the issue becomes more and more strategic. 
Um, the more into the future uh, uh, the decision making is, is taking place, uh, uh, the higher the level of uncertainty. Uh, operational domain is relatively low uncertainty. Things are known to us or can be known to us relatively soon. Uh, typically, uh, in the operational domain, we solve the same problem or similar problems again and again and again. Therefore, learning is relatively easy. Uh, this is also the world where, uh, or the domain where the feedback is relatively immediate. So we tried this solution, didn't work. We try another one, it worked. Okay, we stick with that one. But as we move towards the strategic domain, for obvious reasons, because decisions are panning into the future, the feedback will be slower, if at all. And therefore, we will not get a feedback that allows us to draw the conclusion that this was right. And to the extent that we do get feedback, it's going to be ambiguous, um, fragmented, and in need of interpretation. Which, of course, opens up for all sorts of of biases of the type that uh, Daniel Kahneman is describing in, in, his, uh, in his research. Um, there is a risk that individuals turn strategic decisions, or strat uh, decis uh, decisions in the strategic domain into operational uh, decisions by simplifying them. I would argue, but I know I will uh, get some uh, counter-arguments, that a lot of the things that we do uh, in strategic uh, uh, development uh, in, in terms of models and theories is simply to reduce the complexity uh, in an effort to reduce uh, the problems of making decisions. Uh, I don't know how many times I've been in a management team where they said, okay, let's make a strategy, and they end up with a one-year action plan. And then I say, this is not a strategy, this is an action plan. You're dealing with known things over a known horizon. And they say, well, it has to do. It, it's the best we can do. We don't have time for anything more. And as I said, I'm beginning to suspect that maybe they're not able to. So this is how they deal with it. Now, one reason why they might do this, if I'm right, is that it is deeply uncomfortable to face a problem you cannot understand. It is deeply uncomfortable to be facing a decision of a strategic nature that you can't get your head around. So why not lessen the discomfort by turning it into a seemingly operational decision and solve it as if it was? By grossly reducing the complexity, by assuming things to be certain when in fact they are uncertain. I think there is a risk for that to be a relatively common um, um, thinking process. Now, uh, coming uh, uh, to uh, um, Elliot Jack, what he said was that, in a theory called uh, uh, stratified system thinking, was that uh, in an organization, uh, there will be s uh, several uh, levels of work, work levels, he called them. I call them uh, um, uh, workspaces, uh, basically saying that uh, clearly, um, there are uh, workspaces where pure operational issues are at hand. It is basically a question of, of solving uh, um, uh, low, in, low uncertainty, low complex issues. And then as you, in, in, uh, in uh, Jack's world, uh, climb the organizational uh, hierarchy, you will be facing workspaces that requires more and more uh, strategic thinking. Uh, uh, diagnostic accumulation uh, uh, is different from pure operational in the way that pure operational is known problems, known solutions, high repetition, low uh, uh, uncertainty, low complexity. Uh, diagnostic accumulation is problem solving uh, when you need to collect new types of facts, but uh, uh, the, the feedback loops are so quick that you will be able to find a solution relatively soon and therefore turn it into an operational issue. Uh, tactical strategy in uh, Jack's uh, world were uh, related to decisions over a time period of one to three years. Um, I, I don't know where he got that number from, but basically it's referring to situations where you, uh, 
where you follow strategies that are relatively well known because they can be based at least to some extent on historic, uh, uh, ex uh, historic experience. Um, um, and therefore the, the need for, uh, or the, the level of complexity and uncertainty is um, uh, not that high. Parallel processing, uh, th this is when you need to realize that there is no one story you can tell. You need to deal with the fact that we can see multiple logics and you have to play these logics out in parallel. You have to be aware that, um, that uh, you cannot make a decision, you have to play uh, um, you, you can't make a decision on the logic, so you have to play according to several logics. And pure strategy is when, when basically all the balls are in the air and you need to play according to that. Uh, clearly, not a lot of people uh, need to deal with that type of, of, of uh, work environment, but uh, maybe more people than we think. Um, so this is, this is describing, you, you might say, workspaces providing us with requirements. So our job then is to see, okay, can we identify people capable of making decisions in each and every one of these environments? And uh, uh, the, the two first are basically called the operational domain and the next three, the strategic domain. And we are interested in finding what are the requirements uh, and how is that playing out in cognitive processes uh, when making strategic decisions? Now this is, to make a small detour, uh, a little bit related to um, uh, some research done by uh, a psychologist called Keegan. This is from a book called In Our Heads, The Mental Demands of Modern Life. He basically says that uh, human beings develop as they grow older, it's very much linked to, to age, uh, over five stages. And I've skipped the two first because the, the, the first one you're in diaper and then, then the next one you're in kindergarten. But then gradually you move into the third order. He calls it the socialized mind. Uh, uh, what that basically m means is that uh, when we re reach the age of uh, 18, 19, 20 into uh, maybe 25, uh, we, we are fundamentally basing our behavior and our uh, uh, understanding ourselves and our identity based on a worldview that we internalized from people around us. Parents, of course, teachers, friends, uh, um, bosses. Uh, and this happened because we needed to find our place in the world. We needed to belong. Uh, and then he says, as, as that has matured in us, we begin to develop our own understanding of the world. So we, we develop a new worldview, if you like, that he calls the self-authoring mind, indicating that by the age of 35, 40 maybe, we have developed our own worldview based on our own uh, thinking, and we have authored this uh, ourselves. And some of us, not many, 1%, he says, I don't know exactly how that number uh, was found, develop into a new level that he calls the self-transforming mind, which is, to him, uh, uh, the, the type of mind where we are aware that we are not dealing with the world in itself. We are dealing with a worldview or in, in the in the fifth order, sounds almost like a you know, religious thing there, but forget about that. Uh, 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 we, are deal we, are, we, are, we already understood that we are dealing with multiple ways of understanding the world, and that is okay with us. We can alternate between different logics without being paralyzed, and we can therefore also alternate between different identities without being paralyzed. And the parallel to what we are doing in this pro project is that uh, as, you, as you go along these steps, if you like, uh, uh, you are developing a, a more and more mature understanding of the relationship between you and the world, or if you like, between your thinking and the cognitive processes that you're involved in and the world. And that explains to us uh, 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 partly why 
uh, uh, individuals are scoring the way they do in the CPP test. Because in the early stages, you would be very afraid of making decisions or, or drawing conclusions not supported by your worldview. It has to be logical according to a certain way of understanding the world. Whereas the more mature you are, the, the freer you are to, to say that, well, this is my way of thinking. And that is as good as anyone's way of thinking. There is no objective worldview towards which I can measure the logic of the decisions or the logic that I see. And eventually you begin to see that uh, I can come up with multiple logics and I can test the data I have for the future against many different ways of seeing the world. This brings us then to um, the, uh, um, the, the, the capacities or the abilities. You will recognize now that these are the same. Uh, I've, I've just put them flat there so that you won't think that they are better because they're further up. Um, but when we move over here, uh, we are basically saying that uh, this is in the world of the structure, the, 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 the low complexity, the, the pragmatic, pragmatic as in the, the distance between an idea and actually testing it in real world is very short. Uh, it's short term, it's, it's certain, it's unambiguous, data is relatively clear, uh, and you get an instant feedback. Um, some 200,000 uh, individuals has been tested with this uh, uh, tool, the CPP, and 80% of, of the tested people are basically scoring uh, their capacity or ability in this domain. Uh, as we move towards more and more unstructured, more dynamic, more uh, uh, additional, that is abstract, more long-term, uh, and definitely more ambiguity and with delayed feedback, if any feedback at all. Uh, you see, we get less and less. And funny enough, we have only 1% at pure strategy. Now, I can tell you that uh, in my program, uh, we have uh, uh, tested uh, 27 students and we actually have two. So we are killing the field. There must be something fundamentally good in the guy who selected these students. <laughs> now, what, what we try to understand is what are the more basic or underlying components of the cognitive process going on that renders them to these uh, levels of, of uh, capacity or, or ability. And I'm going to walk you through some of these elements. If I can make this work. No, before I do that, uh, let me just say a few words about strategic thinking, because um, before anyone starts um, uh, fighting with me, we don't know for sure that this test system, the CPP, actually and exactly measures what might be called strategic thinking. We know that it measures something, that, it, that is for sure. And we have reason to believe that it is somehow related to strategic thinking. But a part of the research we're doing now, also uh, uh, already this spring, is to look into uh, how it relates to uh, academic research into strategic thinking. And you see a model here by Olsen and Simerson that basically says that there are three schools, the game theory, the system thinking, and the cognitive psychology school. And, and maybe this is their uh, claim this is where strategic thinking happens. Now, we are not dealing with that at the moment. We are basically saying that at least there is a cognitive component in this. And if you look into all sorts of publications and soon to be read, uh, brilliant thesis by, by, uh, by my students here, uh, these are some of the elements of cognitive psychology that is mentioned again and again. And we find these to be somehow contradictory at times and definitely inexact. So we need a much better um, a model uh, and we need a way of measuring the presence of these in human beings. And this is when we come to the, um, the CPP test. Now, I would have liked to show you the test, uh, but then I, then I couldn't um, test you. And, and I would like everyone here to sign up to be tested. It's a two and a half, three hour test, but it's a lot of fun, wouldn't you say? Uh, and um, oh, and um, 
it's not a self-scoring test. It's not the, 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 the usual kind. On a scale from one to five, how smart are you? It's not that. You actually solve problems. It's almost a sort of a gamification thing that we're doing. You solve complex problems under uncertainty. It's a completely unknown environment to the test person. And based on how they behave on a computer when they solve this, uh, these problems, uh, uh, we can measure, uh, for instance, uh, some cognitive styles. I will not be able to go into all these styles uh, in, in detail, and, and some of them have names that is uh, still to me a little bit puzzling. But for sure, there are some cognitive styles that we clearly can see are facilitating strategic thinking. So I spent last night uh, going through all the reports of all the 25 students that we have tested. Monday, so you see this is really fresh. Uh, and clearly those who scored high also score high here. Uh, they are overall more holistic, i.e. big picture oriented when they think. Uh, they are definitely more quick insight. Uh, the, the, um, the, the problems are increasingly difficult to solve and we can see their learning curve. And those with, uh, that come out as strategic thinkers, they have a steeper curve, they learn very fast how to deal with the uncertainty and the, the unknown environment. They are more intuitive, and I know this is going to um, shock some of you in here because I'm, I'm a big, um, well, what do you say, um, foe of intuition. Uh, but uh, the ability to trust your own insight is measured in, in this system, and they score high on that. They are logical. Uh, uh, which doesn't mean analytical, logical means that you are persistently following a thought pattern uh, over time, as opposed to trial and error, where you're unsystematic. Uh, and what we think is, and we have some reasons to do so, is that some people are prepared to spend some time, energy and discomfort following a line of thought, even though they do not see the endpoint whereas some people give up relatively early because it's so uncomfortable to think a line of thinking where you can't at least begin to see the endpoint. And I'm afraid, maybe, that is, that is uh, the trial and error uh, style is actually more frequent these days than it used to be. Um, they are more integrative, that is, they're, they're better at synthesizing discrepancies. Uh, um, they, they are more open-minded and flexible, and they are more metaphoric in the sense that they are prepared to put together stories, uh, even with very little information, and still make that story come across as meaningful. There are some uh, uh, cognitive styles that are blockers, and I, I, I really do blockers like this, because it, uh, you need also these things, but if you have a lot of it, it actually makes it a little bit more difficult for you to think strategically. Uh, memory, in this case, means that you try to keep everything in your mind, which is going, in the end, it's going to be full, and it, it won't work the way it's supposed to be. And it's you, often excessively using the past as, as the, the foundation of your thinking. Excessively breaking down things in small pieces, the way we did with uh, at least I did when I was a kid, uh, my dad's uh, alarm clock never worked after that. Uh, people that are excessively searching for more and more and more info, so they can never have enough, uh, is, is uh, blocked. Uh, reflective in this case is rechecking for accuracy all the time. Uh, and we can see that in the test. Uh, trial and error, uh, I've already said, um, learning shouldn't be there clearly, and reactive, as in uh, uh, they are quick and inaccurate. They, they, they react to new information very, very quickly without checking, probably because they are not logical, they are not building systematically over time, and therefore they draw um, uh, flawed conclusions. Now, we can see that those who score high are actually also scoring very high here. 
So if this test is actually indicating strategic capability, we now have a list of things that we need to instill in human beings for them to be better decision makers, strategic decision makers. What this test is also uh, uh, indicating to us is some information process uh, handling capacities. And there are some of these that are actually facilitating strategic thinking. Those who uh, score high, that is that we think are actually uh, um, showing sign of, a, of a, um, an excellent ability to think strategically, they also score high on these things. And some of these names are uh, very similar to the styles, but this is actually showing something else. It's, the, it's showing the way they processed information. Uh, so uh, synthesizing, uh, dealing with uh, dynamic complexity and ripple effects, i.e. seeing the consequences of drawing one conclusion, getting new effects for coming con conclusions and therefore for the final decision making. Logical reasoning, uh, verbal conceptualization, that is, uh, in this uh, context basically means that they were able to deal with and synthesize into whole systems of uh, abstract constructs and ideas. Uh, they, they do trust their own judgment uh, and they are quick inside learners. They grasp and utilize new concepts very quickly. Uh, we can see that these things are elements of thinking strategically. They are more present in uh, individuals that score high, that is, that are uh, suitable according to th this theory for parallel processing and pure strategy. We also see that this is not present in any extent in people that are strongly leaning toward uh, uh, operational domain uh, uh, workspaces. So what this basically means is that um, if we want to, and now we're approaching the question number three, the CPP think we think is actually helping us to measure these things. It might need to be fine-tuned, but Fundamentally, we think it is uh, measuring this. Now, the, 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 the third question is, can it be taught? Can it be developed in, in human beings? Uh, um, and can we compress time? I.e., do we have to wait until they're 45? Or can we do it already with a 27-year-old? Um, so you, you recognize the same logic. And for us to bring people there, these are the things that we need to deal with. Uh, and then the question is, can we strengthen the skills or abilities to, uh, to be integrative and synthesizing? Can we, can we increase the ability to deal with dynamics? Can we uh, uh, increase uh, the ability, the, the patience, if you like, of systematic long-term logic reasoning uh, uh, and not giving up simply because I didn't get it the first few seconds? Uh, can we uh, develop in people the ability to conceptualize abstract ideas? Can we uh, develop in people a trust on own judgment? Can we make people more open-minded? I think the answer to this is yes, we can. Uh, we do all the time, but maybe we need to find uh, methods by which we do it even more uh, effective uh, so that we can develop what I call exponential mindsets. And by exponential, we basically mean people that are not following a logical way of thinking into the future based on past experience, but is actually able to think new in the light of new data, new situations, new context, but also in the light of high complexity and high uncertainty. Now, we had a discussion in the, uh, before uh, the lecture here, and, um, and um, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, what I think is a very typical situation. Uh, something has occurred, an event has happened, uh, and we need to deal with that. Uh, unfortunately, decisions don't come with a tag that says this is a strategic decision. It comes simply as an event that you need to deal with. And maybe people that are more towards this, that have these abilities, are better positioned to understand if this decision is actually a strategic decision and would therefore deal with that event or that uh, occurrence in a better way simply because they would deal with it from an exponential mindset point of view. They would see the opportunities or maybe also the long-term threats that this would happen uh, beyond 
the uh, extrapolation of a linear logic. Um, now, if we go back then to, to our uh, uh, program, um, I think it's fair to say that um, in many programs, also at universities, we are uh, not exposing students to situations where these abilities and skills are really developed. Um, I, I, I fight with students all the time over, uh, can you make this question clearer? Can you, can you tell me already before I do the test how I will be scored? Uh, can you simplify the question for me? Can you take away the uncertainty? And can you please give me the tool by which I am going to deal with the complexity that this assignment is actually uh, providing for me? And of course, my answer is no, I can't. Oh yeah, I can, but I won't. Because I want you to face exactly the situation that requires you to develop exactly this. Now, are we really good at it? No, I don't think so. Uh, we need to be much better. But that will require, I think, a different way of seeing how um, education is done, training and development <coughs> is done in a business school like ours. It's more based on a logic that uh, we call, or that is called growth mindset. Uh, uh, I have been discussing with people, can you really, really develop your cognitive style and your uh, 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 information processing profile? And I think you can. You can if you have the mindset of, I can grow. I can actually change. I can question the way I, I think and behave uh, because I am prepared to see the process of growing as valuable and not the process of being right or protecting or supporting what you already know. Which means that we need to allow people to move also in Keegan's world against uh, the fourth and fifth order of things. So they, they can be deeply comfortable with the insight that they are dealing with uh, a confusing array of worldviews where none of them is absolutely true, but all of them might be meaningful for decision making in a certain situation. Um, that might also mean that we have to skip grading and all the boring stuff that students don't want and we don't want, but for some magic reason we still do. Uh, and maybe we'll have to let them out of the classroom because that's a very structured and uh, ordered and low uncertainty environment. Uh, maybe we need to take risks that we are not prepared to take at the moment. But if we did, in a clever way, I am absolutely sure that we could develop uh, people's, even young people's, uh, capacity to deal with high-level strategic workspaces. <coughs> That's my claim. Thank you. <clears throat> I timed this to 45 minutes and I think maybe I did it on 44. That leaves some room for uh, questions. Yes, Jürgen. Yes, can you elaborate a bit on how this might possibly change, uh, for example, executive training programs? Um, in, in how would you operationalize these new findings in, in, in an executive training program? Um, <clears throat> well, um, I would for sure try to do uh, any executive training or any training whatsoever. It doesn't have to be executive. It can be a Master's of Science and Management program, for that matter. Uh, uh, to happen as close to the, um, if you like, real world complexity, uncertainty as possible. Uh, what we do in executive training is quite often to move people into a classroom uh, in order to simplify, reduce and control. Uh, and then we give them uh, highly simplified ideas of how the, the world works, and then we ask them to remember this. Uh, I would go the other way. I would, I would basically say, okay, if, if you currently live in this workspace 
with this level of uncertainty and complexity, we should take you to the next level. We should find opportunities for you to hands-on, on your body, in your face, every day, but under supervision, deal with the challenges of being on a, if you like, higher level or in a more um, testing environment. Um, I think it can be relatively short. Uh, uh, we're not talking about ages. Uh, we're talking about intensity. So that would be one answer. Uh, per Hugo, all the way back there. Thank you for a very nice presentation. But may I, may I challenge you, Stein? Yeah, <clears throat> you may. You like challenges. Uh, I understand that you are offering a kind of a cognitive style perspective on strategic decision making. So by really developing our cognitive styles and, and improving on, on those dimensions, we make better decisions. But at the same time, we are dealing with what you say is so much uncertainty, turbulence, complex dynamics, and, and all that. If I say, even if we develop our thinking very, very skillfully and deeply, we can't cope with that. This cognitive process is, is not enough. I would think we have to act more. You, we, we can't think ourselves into the future. We have to act ourselves into the future. And therefore, I think that action plan that you um, dismissed a couple of minutes yeah, ago I, I knew that should be very, very thing. well as a learning plan for how to act yourself into the future. Well, uh, as you know, we, we do agree on this. Uh, uh, thinking without acting doesn't make a difference. So clearly, the next step in this is to see how thinking is moving into acting and playing out. And we also know that uh, even if, if, if I act, I'm acting in an environment that will act against me maybe sometimes. So it's a very, very complicated uh, uh, process. But my answer to you would be this. Uh, to act, you have to think. Uh, unless your acting is completely random, and it r seldom is. And I would say, okay, maybe you're right, maybe we can't cope, or, or you're probably right, we can't completely cope with the complexity and uncertainty we meet. But what we can do is at least to increase our awareness of how we think, so that we can take away the decision-making that happens when we are completely or semi-unaware of why we are behaving the way we are. Now, you know, because you've taught me this uh, uh, many years ago, that uh, the way we develop theories and strategy is to look back and say, okay, let's find a, a few companies that earn a lot of money over a long time and see what they have in common. So we saw all these theories developed over years, all based on the same fact. Let's uh, synthesize the lessons learned from the most profitable. But we also know that five years after, they were not so profitable anymore. So we have thrown out the one model after the other because we saw that that method is actually not sustainable in the long run. We do not fully capture what makes them more profitable than others. Maybe because it's not capturing the subtleties, the complexity, the variety, the many dimensions of thinking strategically, and therefore acting strategically. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, strategic thinking can never turn us into someone who always make the right decision, but I'm absolutely sure it can pr improve the quality of decision making so that we at least avoid the baddest of them. There you got it. <laughs> That's my old teacher, you know, so I'm supposed to fight him. More questions?
um, I understand the irony of this, but I'm going to ask you to um, give me some example for like role models, because I need to understand, um, which is kind of ironic, I know, but do you have any examples of someone who is, who is using this mindset in a successful way? Uh, no, I'm not. Well, uh, in a few months' time, I will be. Uh, I already know the name of uh, uh, two of our students that have this way of thinking, but since my fellow uh, researchers are here, and I am uh, uh, actually asking them to interview some of this, uh, the tested persons, and they're not supposed to know uh, who scored what, I can't tell you, but I, I can do afterwards, and I can introduce you to one of them. Uh, there are people with this ability around. Uh, do I know a famous person? Yeah. Is Indira Gandhi or was Mahatma Gandhi such a person? Or is Pege Yulenhammer, did he have this? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I haven't tested them. But have, uh, you, have you done the test yourself? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the score is classified information. <laughs> no, I, I have done the test. Uh, but, but I don't know my own score. Uh, and th that has to do with the whole project we're doing. But eventually, uh, in a few weeks' time, I will know, and, and you will be the first to know. <laughs> More questions? There's a uh, hand over there. Now, uh, I, can, I can pick up on one question that uh, uh, usually comes, and that is, uh, is it related to uh, intelligence? Uh, and it's not. Well, it, it is, of course, uh, uh, to the extent that you need to be above average. But if, if you're 120 or 160, it doesn't have any impact whatsoever. Uh, actually, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a correlation between uh, uh, researchers and uh, strategic thinking in the sense that uh, um, highly qualified researchers score relatively low. Uh, and and the, my interpretation of that is that some of the qualities that I showed you in, in processing and thinking style, uh, 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 conducive to operational thinking, are also the things that you deal with when you do you know, research. Okay. Um, hello. Thank you for the presentation. My, I am um, I am active in something called uh, British Parliament debating here in Lund. Um, sort of uh, been doing that for a while. And what we do is that we are assigned different positions in a debate. We don't get to really choose, and we ha we are sort of forced to take uh, varying perspectives and debate from things that we don't really stand for. I can imagine that this perhaps improves our sort of ability to. Um, um, to, to, to reach the fifth sort of dimension, perhaps. Okay. But my question is, uh, is there sort of evidence for there being, this being something you can practice, uh, like this, i.e. this exponential mindset? Can you, are there evidence for this? Uh, uh, yes, the, the, uh, we don't have that yet, but, uh, uh, but there are. Uh, uh, we have a small problem. It's a, that's actually a huge problem. Uh, and that is that you can't, you can't be tested and retested using the same tests. Uh, uh, you have, you, at least you have to wait uh, a number of years or you have to have a heavy um, Alzheimer. Uh, because you, you actually, uh, once you get it, you get it. Um, so we can't, we can't test someone and then do something with them and then test them again and see if it had a, a, an effect. That makes it a little bit more difficult. You can still do experiments, but you have to do it differently. Uh, but um, the Cognitive, the company behind here, they have been doing tests uh, before and after certain activities. Uh, and, and they can see uh, an increased uh, ability. Now, we don't have a, a, a strong uh, evidence for it, and I think that we, we don't fully understand the complexity of it. If you, if you go back to some of the components, some of them are easier to develop in a human being than others. And, and we don't fully understand the, uh, how these uh, uh, skills and, uh, and cognitive information processes interplay to create the ability. Uh, 
uh, we don't know the cutoff rates of the, the various uh, capabilities, if you like. Um, so still, we we can't tailor make or you know r really uh, uh, pinpoint the things that needs to be changed. So it's a it's a relatively massive um, uh, intervention, and, and that of course is very in ineffective. But yes, it can. Now, uh, um, um, if, if by exponential minds, if the underlying mindset of what I call the exponential mindset, uh, and, and to me the exponential mindset has a lot to do with your willingness and ability to think new things um, uh, against all sorts of, of, of uh, emotions and, and moral issues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and, 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 and scare. Uh, I think that sometimes... Um, a large proportion of, of human beings are actually more afraid of being wrong than not knowing. Uh, so they don't test themselves in a way that expands their mind. But, but uh, um, uh, what, I, what I showed, the growth, growth mindset is, is based on some research done in the United States where they actually do um, in interventions to help kids, not grown-ups uh, uh, yet, to... Uh, to have a more growth-oriented mindset. And I think that if, if that happens, you can also develop an exponential mindset. Okay, some further questions? If not, I have a question to you. Um, we are going to test 200 individuals. And, and this far, we have only found 40. So, uh, what is it, a 50 in here? Uh, so that's going to be 90. Uh, if you are interested in our research, if you would like to, uh, to know more about it, and maybe even um, in the autumn be tested, uh, please come forward. I'm going to have a piece of paper here that you can write your name and email address, and, and we will for sure contact you uh, when, when we're ready for it. And I guarantee you it's, uh, the, the test is a lot of fun. It's a, it's a really uh, challenging and fun experience. Um, and maybe I'll throw in a lunch. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you, Pastor, for this really interesting uh, lecture. And uh, thank you, the audience. And uh, I hope that uh, you will make a, a really good strategic decision or to use one of Stein's expression, expressions, uh, a pure strategy, and come back to School of Economics and Management. Uh, the 10th of May, we will have our next seminar in this series. And uh, that will be our professor in economics, uh, Tommy Andersson, who will give a lecture in Swedish. Uh, optimala beslut om folket själv får välja. Optimized decision if the people get to choose. So uh, welcome back. And staying uh, after a good, way, good day's work uh, tonight, you can listen to some music. Thank you. Thank you.